Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Talk Gnosis. This is part four of four of our conversation with Dr. M. David Litva of Virginia Tech talking about personal deification. In this final part, we are uh, talking about some interesting things, but last time we talked about how ordinary people can become divine and can be uh, deified themselves. We talked about theonomy, which uh, was an interesting concept of God giving his name to people. Chatted a bit about Simon Magus, and we talked about Yeldabaoth as a self-deifying rebel. In this episode, we continue our conversation about Yeldabaoth, and we talk about whether or not he gets redeemed through the creation mythos, or whether he just kind of remains stubborn to the end. We then talk about Lucifer and how he is also a self-deifying rebel and uh, kind of how his story is a cautionary tale. We talked about deification in the Gospel of Thomas, one of our favorite texts, the error of deification by grace, and uh, we talk about how self-deification happens today. So you're going to want to watch all the way to the end to see how you too can become God using this one easy trick. So coming up, Part 404 of our conversation with Dr. M. David Litva, Personal Deification. And Yeldabaoth, uh, is there any hope for him? <laughs> does, he, do, does he come out, does he say, oh, you know what, maybe I was wrong? You know, that's interesting because in certain texts at, uh, of Nagamadi, we have a secondary character character called Sabaoth, mm -hmm. who is depicted as Yaldabaoth's son. And, yeah, and Sabaoth does repent. Um, he looks at his father's error and he essentially says, Dad, you know, I'm out of here. You know, I'm, I'm you know... I'm going to lift myself up to a higher level of heaven that's higher than you, and I'm going to rule as uh, as a deity, mm -hmm. and let you have your own little world below, uh, which you're eventually going to be imprisoned and destroyed. But there is a sense, I think, in Gnostic texts that you, an archon can repent, uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem that Yaldabaoth makes that decision. <laughs> I have a uh, I have a wild theory that I'm working on right now that's based on nothing at all that um, that Yaldabaoth is actually part of a, a trinity um, in that between Yaldabaoth, Saklas, and Samael that uh, okay. he's a, mm -hmm. a kind of a, a, a trinitarian um, uh, concept that exists within the uh, within the Sethian corpus. But like I said, there's there's no, uh, no no textual or literary uh, reference to that. I just like it. Uh, well, you got you got two out of three there with Savio being a son. So right. Sorry, I, I zoned out for a bit. What were we saying about Trump again? Oh this is no. Usually, oh, ba boom. Shh. We'll uh, lose our nonprofit status. Cut it out. Yeah. All right. That's right. That's right. No politics. Okay. Right. Um, uh, uh, I, I guess moving on. Although that. That's fascinating. Again, oh, there's, actually, there's before show. we go on oh, yeah. to the next yeah. question, sorry, now I screwed up yeah. the graphic. Sorry, Dan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, I also wanted to mention, um, in addition to the people we've already talked about, people or figures or deities that we've already talked about from your book, you uh, you talk about Lucifer also. Can you do a quick uh, quick little summary of of how, where Lucifer fits into all of this? Yeah, Lucifer, or um, as he's called in the Hebrew Bible, Hello ben Shachar, that is the shining one, son of the dawn, goddess. He is uh, depicted as a kind of primal self-deifying figure. Uh, in Isaiah 14, he has this great scheme where he's going to rise upon the clouds and assault the divine council and sit on the throne of God. And even before he's done thinking, he is thrown down into the <laughs> and I, I think you know this is the primal fear of Hebrew religion that you could have a tyrant and the true tyrant is the one who claims absolute power and I think I think in, if you're an ancient Israelite, this terrifies you, as it should terrify us today, that self deification is, in many cases, and we should not deny it, it is the ultimate power grab. Mm. And it is the attempt to claim not just any power, but supreme power. 
And anyone who does that is, from the Jewish perspective or the Israelite perspective, is, is destined to fall. Now, I say that there are two myths of self-deification. There's the self-deifying rebel, and that would be this Hillel or Lucifer figure or Yaldabaoth. Mm -hmm. But there's also the self-deifying hero, in which they often come as a hidden deity or a deity in disguise, like Jesus and Simon. And they don't reveal their true identity, or they reveal it in a very gingerly way, through miracles and through certain secret declarations, and they are actually persecuted on earth, and there's not a hint of arrogance about them. Mm -hmm. And in the end, although they might be killed and vilified, they do rise to the stars. And so there's two myths at work here, and we need to be very careful that both are biblical, mm -hmm. that it's not just, we don't just have the self-deifying rebel, we also have the self-deifying hero. Because in principle, if you know what deity is and you know what it means to share power, then you don't, then deifying yourself in principle ought to involve not a sliver of arrogance. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah. absolutely true. <laughs> you, you have to be a special kind of crazy, which I think probably relate, some of us can relate. Uh, to to want to say, <laughs> yeah. you know what? <laughs> Maybe I could be God. Eh, why not? <laughs> why not me? Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, anyways, let's uh, let's move on. <laughs> um, the uh, we we also talk a lot on this show about the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, any ideas about deification uh, hidden among the sayings of the Gospel of Thomas? Yes, and I don't think they're quite hidden. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think this this gospel is probably more than any other is the gospel of, of human deification. And it's, uh, again, deification for the small man. You know, it's not just Jesus, as in the gospel of John, strutting about and saying, I and the Father are one, and before Abraham was, I am, and I'm the big stuff and you guys follow me, and if you don't, you're damned. It's exactly the reverse mm. in the Gospel of Thomas. It's it's the incredibly in, inclusive Jesus, the Jesus who is totally including people within his own deity. And this is really the key, that he, one becomes, if you're going to have a Christian theory of deification, Jesus isn't the guy who realizes his own divinity, and he's the only God form a new form of monotheism that we just call trinitarianism mm -hmm. and nobody else can then be divine that i think is a lie and i think it's totally foreign to early christianity and certainly foreign to the gospel of thomas in the gospel of thomas jesus welcomes people into his own divinity and is simply a model for us to realize our own divinity in the most humane and um mystical way possible and through careful humble meditative reflection on the profound sayings of jesus himself and so the very things that are said of jesus that he is the light above them all and saying seven seventy seven is similar to what we find and about said about regular christians and that we have the light within and the gospel of thomas saying 24 and that we come from the light, and that we're the children of the light. So, and just as Jesus is the Son of God, we are the children of God. That's all over the New Testament as well. He has a kind of priority, but it's only a, it's only relative priority. He's not a fundamentally different being than we are. We are, if we're doing things right, we're evolving to be what he is. He is the model. He is the way, not in the sense of the exclusive way, he's the way in the sense that he shows us who we really are. Mm -hmm. And unless we become Christ, we have missed the point. In our, uh, in the Joannite liturgy, we refer to Jesus as the exemplar of our, of our liberation. Um, and I always like that as a symbol mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, he, he showed us the way, and, but we get to go too. Mm -hmm. 
Precisely. Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife, Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please. Uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic educational ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption, and back to the show. Let's skip ahead by thousand years or so uh but we can uh we can stay you were just talking about divine light actually uh but a lot of our listeners are interested in saint gregory of palamas and uh, the hesychasm can you talk a bit about what you call deification by grace and, and about uh some of uh, saint gregory's ideas well that is quite a leap um what, <laughs> I'll say, what i'll say first is that there's a certain theological problem that I have with deification by grace. You have a lot of people today who believe in deification and are trying to make it kosher for Western Christians. And one of the ways to do this is to emphasize the idea of grace, which I think is fine in and of itself, but we can, we can get trapped into this, uh, especially if we try to fit it into exclusively Protestant formulations. As is well known, Luther preached salvation only by grace, by grace alone. And if we, the idea seems to be that if we can make deification by grace and by grace alone, then we can make it kosher and acceptable for all Christians and not look like evil heretics, <laughs> megalomaniacal blasphemers. This is all well and good, but it one has to be very careful of distorting the teaching and I think deification by grace uh, is fine as far as it goes, but there's a danger of viewing deification as kind of like a gift, like you would receive a bicycle. <laughs> uh, deification isn't. God gave really... me a bicycle and. <laughs> <laughs> and Godhood. Yeah. <laughs> That's, Merry you Christmas. Know, it's just not the point. Deification is an experience. And it involves your full body and your full spirit. And it's not something that God can hand you like a cookie. It's something that you're fully involved in and you're fully working toward. So if we just put this emphasis on grace, we essentially nod to Luther, which is fine if you like Luther. But the point is that in many cases, if salvation the, in the deepest sense is deification. It involves our whole body and everything that we do and think. And therefore it involves work and real work and real prayer. 
And certainly this is true in the hesychastic tradition. You don't you don't get deified by eating a donut, you know, uh, on the beach and by going to play video games and waking up at noon. You get deified because you're up at 430 with your head in, you know, right or your chin right against your belly button and praying fervently the prayer of Jesus or the Jesus prayer and doing this for hours and hours and hours until the light begins to shine in you that's not eating a cookie that's not God handing you deification you're working toward that and it's because of who you are and the fact that you are in your spirit compatible with the divine energies already that deification in the Eastern tradition makes sense. So, sure, we can talk about deification by grace, but let's just be clear that we need to know a whole lot more about what's really involved here and not fool ourselves into thinking that this is something that we can just, like an implant or a pill we can eat, we, you know, we'll wake up into a new consciousness as superhuman beings. No, this is something that our whole body and our whole soul and our whole spirit are involved in, and it is work, and it is hard work. And this is the spirit, it is a spiritual practice, and this is what Gregory supported. It's the good news and the bad news of uh, Gnostic salvation as well, right? Like, it's available to anybody, but you gotta, you gotta work on it, you gotta do the work. Yeah, because it's knowledge is not information. Mm -hmm. It's experiential yeah. knowledge. And I don't care how much of Wikipedia you read, you're never <laughs> going to deify yourself. I always say, you know, I just got to read one more book and then I, you know, then I'm done, right? Like, let's just. <laughs> well, you go there. <laughs> uh, how are we doing for time, Father? Uh, six minutes. Oh, six minutes. Um, ish. I ish. Okay. Uh, well, I would just like to go back to your previous Wikipedia and book comments. Of course, if you buy Dr. Litfuss books and read them all, you will self divinize. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, we'll have links. Yeah. We, we well, will have you links better put your the, whole uh, body and soul into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that burning any, sensation anything? means that it's working. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Before we end with the, the uh, with the leading question I put at the end of the <laughs> of the uh, the sheet, was there something anything else you want to ask about Father uh, that we've touched on? Uh, lots, but uh, let's lots, just yeah. uh, let's wrap it up and, and uh, we'll continue this later, I guess. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Lippa, I'm wondering. So we've talked a lot about the past. Uh, so uh, the, we went way back to the ancient world. We did skip ahead a thousand years, but uh, we're still far into the past. These ideas about self deification divinization, are they still around and believed and practiced? Um, uh, can you find them outside of religion? Are, are they still in the modern world and in the West anywhere? So, or are they just uh, something interesting for scholars to read about? Well, as far as I know, Christianity is still around, and it is and remains the cult of immortality, which promises immortality to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. And I think that is significant. I think the impulse toward the immortalization or the eternalization of ourself is one of the strongest impulses that is programmed into us biologically, and that we have various means of eternalizing ourselves, and some people have now with tech, by technological means, taking this into their own hands. Transhumanists are thinking seriously about uploading themselves, uploading their consciousness onto a supercomputer or using biogenic implants and nanoprobes uh, to not only increase their own consciousness uh, potentially to an infinite level, but essentially to eternalize themselves on a different platform, to escape this wet platform we call the flesh and enter into uh, essentially a digital or a cyber platform. There's other ways that one can imagine this happening. Um, mutation, the, the process of evolution pushing the human body into something much superior than it is right now. Again, other kinds of implants and uh, tools, and sometimes people uh, think that they can do this alone, and sometimes they think that they can do this together. But this impulse toward, it's not just toward survival, it's toward immortalization. And I think everybody does this on some level. 
that we really think that if not our own individuality, uh, then surely the race, the race ought to be immortalized or our community ought to be immortalized, whether it be our church or our nation, that we are valuable enough to be immortal. And I think this is what human rights is all about, that we are sacred. And even if our bodies die, we, our spirits are immortal and we, in a sense, deserve to be immortal. And we think of ourselves or our communities as ultimate, even if they aren't. And we're still striving for this ideal, even if we never get there. And so I think it's definitely here. And I think deification is here to stay. And I think one now needs to talk about how to engage in the process responsibly, particularly when you do have people who are truly arrogant and may might have billions of dollars in order to immortalize themselves while the rest of us just have kids and uh, or just live horrible lives and die in agony uh, without good medical treatment. Um, you, we have a situation where we are now responsible for each other, responsible for keeping this planet in good enough order so that at least potentially the race could survive another thousand or another million years. And people need to be thinking about what myths we need to be using in order to responsibly think about eternalizing the human, human consciousness uh, and the human race. And so we need to think about, is Superman going to be our myth or Iron Man, the individual maverick who attains a kind of superhuman power and possibly immortalizes himself? Are we going to think on the superhuman model? Or are we going to think of other models, ways that we can together forge ahead into the future and keep ourselves alive, at least live as if consciousness was eternal and as if we were, were worth remembering for the next billion years, even when the sun dies out. These are questions that we need to think about. These are stories that we need to tell. And we're responsible for the kind of stories that we tell about deification. Because if the tyrant does get control, if there is truly a self-deifying megalomaniac out there, a braggart, who could lead us to destruction, then we also need to bring him down. And so that is what I mean about keeping these myths, being responsible with how we think about eternalizing ourselves, which I think because humanity is at bottom good, deification is good and something worth striving for. Well, on that motivating note, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. The book is Desiring Divinity, Self-Deification in Early Jewish and Christian Mythmaking. The author, Dr. M. David Litva of, of Virginia Tech. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, it, it's always uh, always edifying to, uh, to have you on the show. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Litva. That was amazing. I'm <laughs> sorry.